This is CBC Here and Now. A huge night for the St. John's Edge as they get ready to play their first ever franchise game here at Mile One Stadium. You can see the team that are getting warmed up here now. I'm live at the center and I'll have that story coming up. And Christmas Clash. Schools in this province cut ties with Operation Christmas Child. He was charged with street racing, but one of the men accused in Hannah Thorne's death says not guilty. Frustrating because we've been waiting too long. You don't stay, you don't play. A young hockey star from Shehashi wants off the bench. Welcome to the weekend. Unfortunately, not a ton of this in the forecast as the clouds will dominate, but overall quiet as the Christmas hustle and bustle begins. Your full forecast is coming up. Let's get to our top story tonight. A massive search is underway in the Bellevue Beach area today. The biggest search yet in connection with the homicide of Courtney Lake. And it comes almost six months after the 24 year old was last seen. Here and now's Megan McCabe has been on the ground with the searchers all day. Megan, why the focus on that particular area? hopefully to bring peace to Courtney Lake's family and all of the many, many people working to find her body, including all the searchers here today. Police say they got new information about this particular area, this, the abandoned Smallwood Farm here in Bellevue Beach. Information that's credible enough for them to bring in five volunteer search groups. Almost 90 searchers have been combing through the land and the woods surrounding this area today, along with the RNC search managers and an RCMP officer working together on this this massive endeavor and I'm told they've been organizing this search for the past week. With such a large area out here this time, the association brought five teams. Every team from Clarenville East is here represented and it's to make sure that we cover this area as methodically as we can to make sure that if there's anything here to do with her disappearance, we find it. And Megan, do we know if they've found anything? Unfortunately, they haven't found anything yet, although RNC Sergeant Paul Didham says they have identified a few areas of interest that they're going to come back to tomorrow. They also searched all the structures on this farm, but they didn't find anything there either. Now, today's search comes exactly one month to the day since searchers were going through the woods just down the road from here on the family cabin of Philip Smith. He's Courtney Lake's ex-boyfriend. If you remember, um, Smith killed himself and police found his body in the early morning hours of November 1st and searchers then spent the day in that area but said nothing turned up in connection to the Lake homicide. And police say Smith is the only suspect in her murder, but they believe that other people out there aren't sharing information. So Megan, uh, do we know if anyone has come forward? We don't know. All we know is that this new information led police to focus on this spot. And, you know, they really are focusing here with so many resources concentrated. We actually got an inside look at their command center today, it, including a look at drone footage as it was being captured with this drone going through the grid and even picking up field mice on the ground while searchers are very, very slowly going along lines, searching the ground and up through the trees as with each step that they took like along this whole area. So basically this is the overview of the map that the area is being searched. What you look at here when you see all these lines, different colored lines, those are search teams that went out earlier today. So as you can see it looks very congested, uh, there's a lot of colors on there. Uh, every line you see there is not just one person, that's a team that's out there searching. So it could be anywhere from four to eight people just depending on how uh, big the line we want to search. And uh, so that's, uh, as you can see, it's, it's very well searched. The entire area, as you can see, is a fairly large area, like Mr. Blackmore mentioned earlier, about 13 acres. With winter coming and the days getting shorter, the ground starting to freeze over and the threat of snow, the pressure is really on to find Courtney Lake's body. Some of these searchers have been involved in all eight of the RNC led searches. Now they had to call it quits at dark this afternoon, but uh, the RNC is holding the scene overnight and 125 volunteer searchers will be back here at daylight tomorrow to continue this search. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Megan McCabe in Bellevue Beach. 
The second man implicated in the death of Hannah Thorne has pleaded not guilty. Stephen Mercer from Upper Island Cove entered his pleas at Supreme Court in St. John's this morning. Mercer is accused of street racing and criminal negligence causing 18-year-old Hannah Thorne's death. Thorne and her grandmother Gertrude were driving on the New Harbour Barrens in July of 2016 when they were struck head-on. Mercer's co-accused, Brian King, has already pleaded guilty. Mercer heads into a two-week trial next fall. The case for a young man accused of violently killing his mother's boyfriend has been postponed. Graham Vitch is accused of first-degree murder in the death of David Collins. The well-known pharmacist was killed at their family home in Logie Bay Middle Cove, Outer Cove, almost a year ago. Vitch's lawyer, Mark Grushy, says he's waiting for a report that will dramatically influence the case. He'll be back in court next month. Schools in this province are ending a popular holiday tradition. The English school district is cutting its ties with Operation Christmas Child, a campaign that fills shoeboxes for children in more than 150 countries around the world. The district says Samaritan's Purse, that's the group behind the projects, asks volunteers to sign statements of faith. This is to confirm that they don't believe in same-sex marriage or a woman's right to a legal abortion. But that's not in line with the board's beliefs, and the district says there are other, more inclusive charities to choose from. Two months ago, a judge had some harsh words for the Mounties and provincial occupational health and safety investigators. A worker had died on the job. The judge said their investigation was completely inadequate. Those comments raised questions about how workplace deaths are investigated in this province and whether things need to change. As Here and Now's Rob Antle reports, those questions still have not been answered. C.J. Curtis was just 20 when he died two years ago. He fell through a skylight while working on the roof of this building in Trapassi, and police said he was not wearing a harness. His employer was later charged with occupational health and safety violations. In September, Judge James Walsh dismissed those charges. Walsh noted that the company was safety conscious and had a safety plan in place and instead took aim at the RCMP and occupational health and safety officials, calling their investigation completely inadequate. In my opinion, this matter was very poorly investigated. No measurements taken at the scene of the accident, no photos until more than eight hours after it happened. The scene needed to be preserved. The evidence before me is full of rough estimates and speculation. There needs to be some communication. I mean, you can't, what happened in Trabassi should never have happened. We'll never know the full story. The family will never know that full story. Mary Shortle says police and provincial safety investigators need to get on the same page. There needs to be some work done between uh, police forces and government, and, you know, through their occupational health and safety divisions to understand the procedure, to train investigators, to look at uh, workplace fatalities from that point of view. The Mounties and the province aren't talking about the judge's comments. Service NL Minister Sherry Gambin Walsh declined interview requests from CBC. But in a statement, the department said safety officers did their investigation in accordance with established policies and procedures for such an incident, and noted that further review of the court ruling will be required to gain a full understanding of what led to the dismissal of the charges and whether any changes to procedures are necessary. It's not clear when that review will be completed. Rob Antle, CBC News, St. John's. People in Newfoundland and Labrador with HIV are being diagnosed later here than anywhere else in the country. That's the finding of a study released today on World AIDS Day. Authors wanted to figure out why tests aren't happening. These patients had been seen by physicians many times in the five years prior to diagnosis, meaning to say that they had accessed care, they had had an opportunity to have a test, but either the physician hasn't requested the test or the patient hadn't requested the test and therefore the diagnosis was missed. And so we think that the system can be improved to uh, improve early diagnosis of HIV in the province. One option could be to allow people to get tested in pharmacies. A six-month pilot project tested that idea, offering instant results from a finger prick. But there are challenges to making it available in more places.
The test is so easy, anybody could be trained to do this test very simply within an hour. The issue is regarding counseling and providing support. And in the event that you get somebody who um, does have a reactive test, what does that mean and how do you explain that result to someone? All right, let's bring Ryan in to talk uh, about the weather now. Of course, big weekend. Big weekend. It's yeah. always big when it's the weekend, <laughs> but it's even more popular, going to be more popular this weekend. Mm, that's right. Santa Claus, the big the guy. parade, uh, rescheduled St. John's. Mount Pearl's parade goes tomorrow as well. A lot of parades on the go this weekend, of course, in many communities across the province. The good news, no big storms coming through. Of course, Absolutely. lots of hustle and bustle. Of it course. seems like as soon as the calendar flips to December, everybody goes into Christmas mode. So uh, the good news is uh, that, yeah, no big storms tracking through that are going to be a big hindrance on those traveling in or out of town. Uh, not really going to see much of uh, this guy, though, Mr. Sunshine. Uh, Jeff Legg, thank you very much for this picture. Beautiful sunrise shot over the CCGS Sir Wilfred Grenfell. Uh, great shot there taken offshore uh, this week. Now, uh, again, that area of high pressure will keep some sun in the mix, especially for central parts of Newfoundland and Morrill. But this little trough here is going to be bringing our best flurry chances to the southeast parts of Labrador tonight and through tomorrow. And shower and flurry chances for western parts of Newfoundland as we roll into the Saturday time period. And you can see that there. The other main story this weekend is for St. John's, the northeast uh, from Bonavista to St. John's and the Avalon Peninsula. An onshore flow will bring persistent clouds, drizzle and freezing drizzle chances as temperatures dip to the freezing mark in the overnight and early morning hours. And that threat of drizzle will continue into your Sunday forecast, including parade time. Not enough to cancel it, in my opinion, but uh, we'll talk more about that with the organizer, uh, one of the organizers of the parade coming up a little bit later with your full forecast as well. Debbie? There is a buzz at mile one in St. John's tonight. Yeah, and our own Jeremy Eaton's out there trying to get autographs. The Edge <laughs> are less than an hour away from their first basketball game here at home.
Welcome back to here now a big night for the National Basketball League's newest team the St. John's Edge of course. Mile One Center is sold out tonight for the expansion team's first home game. And one of the most excited people there is our very own Jeremy Eaton who is courtside. <laughs> Jeremy what's the atmosphere like yeah. at Mile One? Well, I'm just looking around. The doors just opened at 6 o'clock, so about uh, 14 minutes ago, but there's people starting to fill up in the sands. People are taking pictures. People are wearing edge gear. But we have a very special guest here. We have one of the owners who flew in from New York for the game, Rob Sabah. Rob, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Rob, how does it feel knowing that this is opening night here in uh, St. John's for the team? Oh, you know, it, it, this is so this is so exciting. And when, and when they told us about the community support, and tonight's a sellout, it, this is just, it's spectacular. It's humbling. It really truly is very humbling to be here right now. Rob, it's been a busy couple of months. How much work has gotten into getting it ready here on the court behind us? Well, you know, we, we were granted this franchise probably six months ago, and we probably had four months to, to get going. The staff up here really deserves all the credit. Every day they would email us. Every day they would call us with all their accomplishments, and they deserve all the credit. I'm so happy that they're going to see the rewards tonight. This is great. So, Rob, I understand it's your first time in St. John's. What's your impression of the city so far? Just lovely, polite. Uh, it's a, I can't wait to see a little more of it tomorrow and take a tour. But I've, I've tried to read up as much as possible. And, uh, you know, one of our partners is, is, uh, is relatively a local boy, so he's told me a lot about it. Great, great place. Now, we talked to the star player and a, uh, a fan favorite, Carl English, our, our local boy, and he said he's, uh, he's played in front of 20,000, 30,000 fans. Tonight there's going to be just over 4,800, but he says he's going to be a lot more nervous because it's local. Now, you're the owner. Like, yeah. Are there any nerves for you tonight watching your, uh, your precious team behind I, you? I, yes, I, yes, we are nervous. I, I, I am nervous. We, we, we vowed always to bring a great product. I think we did. I think these first five games you saw, we're, we're, we may be an expansion team, but we're not an expansion team. And what do you think of the coaching staff, Coach Dunlap, and the job that he's done with his team in such a relatively short period of time? Yeah, we, we you know, we did not give uh, the coach and, and his staff a lot of time to prep. Um, if you recall, we didn't even have any exhibition games. This team has played five games, <laughs> and they look good. They, they look good. They, they look certainly good. did. Rob, thanks so much for joining us. We Thank appreciate you. your time. Hope you enjoy Thank your time you. in St. John's and the game. And uh, reporting live from Mile One Center, I'm Jeremy Eaton. Back to you, Anthony. All right, Jeremy, having a good time. Now to a serious story. A racing boat that was abandoned in June off the coast of Newfoundland has washed ashore in Ireland. You might recall our story about skipper Michel Zambelli. He had to be rescued from the North Atlantic during a transatlantic race when his nine-meter sailboat started taking on water. And this happened about 650 kilometers southeast of Newfoundland. A cormorant helicopter saved Zambelli, but the boat was left behind. And here's how he explained the rescue at the time. You say, I need to save my life now. <laughs> and so you ask the rescue, you try to understand if uh, someone uh, received your message. And after, uh, you hope, you hope, and you're waiting. Uh, and finally, you see arrive uh, the airplane and after the helicopter. But uh, when you're waiting, you are, you are afraid. You are very afraid. Now, RTE News in Ireland is reporting tonight that the sailboat washed ashore on a beach near West County Kerry in Ireland. A surfer spotted the upturned hull on Tuesday, called the Coast Guard, which then identified the vessel as that abandoned racing boat. First, we have the message in a bottle that floats from here <laughs> out to Ireland, and now that boat. He had a really close call, though, didn't he, he the did. skipper? Yeah, he did. And remember when he talked to us, he, he was definitely, he was very grateful to be rescued, but it was pretty tense out there for him. The pressure's on Ryan as many weekend plans are dependent on whether Sunday's Christmas parade will go ahead in downtown St. John's. We'll try to nail down an answer next.
Welcome back once again. So, Ryan, the uh, St. John's Christmas Parade, as we talked about earlier, canceled last weekend. Big question is, will the weather allow for it? Mm -hmm. And apparently Santa's got a new ride. That's right, he does. And, of course, the big question, uh, will it go, will it not go? Anyway, I headed downtown to find a little more about uh, the parade and uh, just how rare it would be if it got canceled again. Okay, so the forecast looks good as of now. A bit of drizzle, but, I mean, you can handle that. A drizzle, a little bit, we can handle. A deluge of rain, not so good. Yeah. Uh, if if something changes and it has to be cancelled again, that's pretty unprecedented, isn't it? Ryan, this is the 29th year for the annual downtown St. John's Christmas Parade. Once in 29 years have we had to cancel the parade to go to a third date. That's a pretty good record, once in 29 years. And it did go the third date. It went the third day. Yeah. It really did. Yeah. Uh, why don't we talk a little bit about the history of the parade? I mean, it's really grown over those 29 years. Yeah. How many thousands of people do you expect to line the streets? Well, you know, it depends on the weather, of course. And on the ideal day, you're going to get about 50,000. But on average, I would say between 25 and 35,000 every year. Wow, that's really good. It's a lot of people. Yeah. It's a lot of food for the Community Food Sharing Association, and it's a lot of loonies and toonies for them to be able to purchase their perishables as well. 29 years since you were downtown. Do you think yeah. the downtown has a bigger draw than when it was back on the parkway? Debbie was telling me about how the wind would funnel through along the parkway. It was miserable to have the parade up there. Sure. It's a much more welcoming environment to have it in more of a community situation rather than, you know, in the middle of a highway. So um, you also have the lovely shops and stores and coffee shops and restaurants and stuff people can visit. It's just a more welcoming environment to be here in our beautiful historic downtown rather than standing in the middle of the highway. Yeah, it's a draw for the down. It's a big sure. move for the downtown, obviously. Absolutely, yeah. Um, Last question, I hear Santa has a new sleigh this year, is that true? Yeah, we're so excited about that. The employees at Stantec have partnered with us in this agreement over the last three years where they would build floats. The third year this year culminated in building up a new Santa float. So Santa has a new ride and he stepped into the 21st century. So that's pretty much all I can say, except one thing. There's a spirit meter that's on the back of this new float and the louder the crowd cheers, claps, sings the song, whatever they want to do, you're going to see the spirit meter go up. It's like a special fuel that runs the sleigh. Awesome. Awesome. Well, best of luck. Fingers Thank crossed Fingers that crossed. Uh, the forecast holds and uh, best of luck with the event. Thank you, Ryan. And we'll see you there. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Everybody's going like this. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. And uh, I think it'll go because uh, Galen found her Santa hat that she had on. She couldn't find it last weekend. It was canceled. She couldn't find it last year. It got postponed last year as well. Right. But she, she found, found the hat. Good. It's I her lucky hat. It is her lucky hat. Very good. So I think we're good. Uh, so we'll get to that detailed forecast in just a second. If you're heading out this evening, perhaps, to do a little bit of uh, hustling and bustling, uh, note those temperatures are cool. Zero in St. John's. We're starting to see that drizzle onshore already for the St. John's in the metro region up towards Bonavista, that patchy drizzle as well. And as temperatures are near the freezing mark, the chance that some of that will uh, ice on your windshields and may maybe a little bit to scrape off uh, even as early as this evening, but certainly by morning. Note the winds though are relatively light. And so if you're heading out for most of the province tonight, uh, windshield factors aren't too, too bad. Minus nine is what it feels like in Labrador City. Uh, St. Lawrence, uh, that is an error at that station there. Uh, we have uh, our satellite and radar picture. There's the area of high pressure that's, again, basically holding all of that unsettled weather offshore this weekend. But this little trough line is going to be bringing plenty of cloud cover. And as I mentioned, our best snow chances over the next 24 to 48 hours will be here across southeastern Labrador, where we're talking about two to five centimeters. Nothing too significant, but cart right to the Eagle River, uh, back down towards the Straits. Could see, uh, yeah, two to five centimeters uh, by the end of the day tomorrow. Uh, for the West Coast, we're looking at Fleurice to start the day. Cornerbrook near minus two, and again, St. John's near the freezing mark as well, with that freezing drizzle chance early on. And then as we work throughout the day, uh, that becomes a more of a scattered shower chance for the West Coast as winds are in from the south. A pretty quiet day through most of Labrador. And I think even some sun breaks for central parts of Newfoundland. That northeast flow doesn't go anywhere for St. John's. Temperatures should get to around two or, two or three degrees with that uh, onshore flow from the ocean. But the drizzle will persist uh, for most of the day across the Avalon, even Bonavista, Clarenville, not ruling out a drizzle chance for the Buren Peninsula. And again, the uh, flurry chances, those flurry chances become shower chances for the West Coast. Labrador, pretty quiet.
few uh, flurries, Labrador City, Churchill Falls, and so, uh, and uh, again, that snow into southeastern Labrador. So the Mount Pearl Parade tomorrow, drizzle. The St. John's Parade for Saturday, or for Sunday, pardon me, drizzle. And again, that wind will actually be picking up a little bit on Sunday. Note those gusts are going to come in in that 35 to 45 range. So bundle up. It is going to be cool, but relatively dry. Best flurry chances on uh, Sunday will actually be the Northern Peninsula down through uh, central and even western parts of Newfoundland. And yeah, generally just a cloudy day. So there's your forecast. Temperatures highs near two, a little cooler in central, a little warmer along the south coast. Minus eights for Happy Valley Goose Bay and Labrador City with temperatures near minus eight there. And there's a look once again at the big guy. Now that sleigh, we have to get a new picture for next year because he's got the big upgrade, of course, coming with the, uh, the spirit meter. Well, you can see there, uh, we've been through a lot worse. Again, Debbie, you have some great stories with your boys on the parkway oh. when it was the parade was there. That was, as they say, enough to skin you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on the parkway, totally wide open, no protection. I can see why they moved it downtown. Good <laughs> call there. But anyway, yeah, bundle up. Prettier downtown yeah. as well. So it's going to be all things Christmas from now till the 25th, including tree ornaments. Right, That's decoration right. time. And you were sent one by That's a right. I was sent a, a beautiful ornament. Um, now, we'll have to try and find it here because I, I can't seem to, to, to place it, but have a look. Here, we, we brought him into the meeting. Uh, this is Stanley. Or yeah. Shelly. I, I like Stanley, but uh, there he is. Stanley meeting Stanley. I wonder why they sent yeah. you a Maple Leafs um, ornament. That's right. This is from Evelyn Fiquette, by the way, from Blanc de Blanc. There he is uh, uh, checking on the weather. There Dude. he is putting the, the, the here and now story to uh, show together doing his makeup. Uh, so he was really getting a great tour of the CBC building today. Yes. Oh. oh! And there was oh. Anthony! <laughs> Just introducing him some hardware. That was the last I, I saw him. <laughs> Tell me you didn't go through with it, Anthony. No, Look at that in an no. Ottawa senator's yeah, jersey. Yeah, well, yeah. Because okay, good. You, call okay. him, you call him Stanley. I was thinking more of a dreamer because it's pretty wishful thinking to call him Stanley. <laughs> but he's so cute. I couldn't, I couldn't harm him. Yeah. He's very, very nice. A lot You're of lucky. detail. You know, this we we call this Shelly in the beginning. It <gasps> is a it. seashell. It's a seashell. That's right. So, very thoughtful gift. Very. And so Evelyn Fiquette from uh, Blanc Sable. Blanc. He's in safe hands now, Stanley, and uh, he'll be going on our CBC tree. So uh, thank you very much. <laughs> he's shooting and he's scoring, but hockey rules are keeping a young Shehashi boy out of the league that he's used to playing in. That story next.
Welcome back to Here and Now. An 11-year-old hockey prodigy from Sheheshi has been benched from a league that he wanted to be part of. And for three years now, the hockey star has been playing in Happy Valley Goose Bay. But this year, rules are keeping him off the ice. Here and Now's Jacob Barker has more. At 11 years old, Arias Benowin has aspirations. Alexander Ovechkin, that's his role model. He'd like to play in the NHL, just like him. Last year, the story was good. He was invited to big tournaments, turning heads. Oh, he's always shown a lot of promise from even even a couple of years ago, so it's no surprise that he's that he's doing some of the things that he is doing today. But this year, Benoit's stuck. He can't play in the league he's been playing in since he began. His grandfather, his legal guardian, has been with him all the way. He wants to play 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 hockey in Goose Bay so he can play games and play with his friends uh, that that was he's playing for the last three years. You know, last year it wasn't an issue. Shajit had no Adams Division team, but this year Arias has moved up to Pee Wee level, and a Pee Wee level program is starting up in Shajit for the first time. Just a few kids are playing. Arias wants more. It's more challenging. I did speak with Keith Leonard. He's the president of Lake Melville Extreme Hockey. He said that it's a provincial rule that players must play where they reside if there's a league at their level in that place. I did tell him that Sheshashi was willing to release Benoit so that he could play here in Happy Valley Goose Bay, but Leonard said that if he did that, he'd have to do it for every player that asked. Keith Leonard told me that, uh, that there's nothing he can do. There's nothing he can do about this because it's not me suffering. It's, 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 it's my grandson is suffering, right? It's almost December and time's ticking by. His grandfather has been trying to find housing in Goose Bay for the past couple of years. Another family member is willing to take Arias on weekdays so he can reside in Happy Valley Goose Bay where he also goes to school. Lake Melville Extreme requires a hydro bill proving he lives in Goose Bay and it needs to be in the name of his legal guardian. Nothing has worked. Frustrating because we've been waiting too long. And, uh, and now it's almost Christmas, and I don't know what's going to happen after that. Eh? Arias has missed six weeks of the season so far. He may miss his chance to make the All-Star team. Benoit hopes something gives so that Arias can get back on the ice in the place where he feels he belongs. Jacob Barker, CBC News, Happy Valley Goose Bay. A farmer on the west coast is fed up. He's been told he can't install these animal crossing signs on the road near his property in Ship Cove. His land straddles the highway and he worries that one of his animals will wind up on the road. But after shelling out $500 for signs, the province says they don't meet national regulations.
Okay, let's find out who is our athlete of the day. There he is, Carter Lushman of York Harbor. Carter is six and plays 10 bits hockey. And Carter is also a yellow belt at the Marcus Karate School. Great job, Carter. You're today's young athlete of the day. Nice. It is nice. Uh, so this is the time of year once the calendar flips to December. You know I've been showing temperatures across Canada, but now when I start the long range, I'm going to start showing uh, temperatures across North America, and I'll include the sunny destinations to the south mm. because... <laughs> can always dream. We can dream, and because there are so many Newfoundlanders that go down south and watch us from there. So I'd like to include you in the show as well, because we always hear from you folks uh, down in uh, Orlando and Sarasota and St. Pete's, and so... Hello to all of you snowbirds who are uh, watching us uh, online and on perhaps some dishes. Uh, we've got 24 degrees down there. You can see where it's uh, closer to seasonal here back home, anywhere from Vancouver at 7, Fort Mac at minus 2, and uh, Montreal at 2 degrees on the plus side here across Atlantic Canada. As warm as 8 degrees right now in Halifax, and we are going to see a little push of warm air coming up towards the west coast tomorrow. That will have this trough line, which will bring flurries in tonight mixing over to some shower activity for tomorrow. And so that's really, this is going to be our main precip maker this weekend, other than the North Atlantic, which with that onshore northeast flow will bring drizzle from tonight right through Sunday and then a changeover to some flurries on Monday for St. John's. Here's how, again, the timeline plays out Saturday. That uh, trough line will be over southeastern Labrador, the west coast. That onshore flow continues for St. John's and the metro region Note that both Saturday morning and Sunday morning, uh, you may need to scrape the windshield with that freezing drizzle possibility as temperatures do dip close to the freezing mark. There's parade time in case you missed it earlier, around two degrees, a little on the breezy side. You want to make sure that thermos is really uh, full of hot chocolate for the Santa Claus parade on Sunday as you're giving Mr. Anthony Germain a big wave. Uh, there's that area of high pressure. Uh, you're going for him, not Santa, right? Uh, there's that area of high pressure which will continue to hold on as we roll into next week. But note that that system offshore is going to be uh, uh, getting a little closer and we will see those precip chances increasing from Monday across eastern Newfoundland with uh, Flurry chances as temperatures dip, uh, rise to about two degrees. Could see that mix over to some freezing drizzle. Uh, so we'll keep that in mind. Overall, there that uh, that's your forecast, though. Not great, but not terrible for the next three days. Now note this: as we roll into next week, this area of high pressure will move to the east. We're going to see all that mess offshore clear, and our next system moves in from the west. This is snow to rain for much of Labrador. I think the west and the north stay snow, but Happy Valley Goose Bay, uh, southeastern parts of Labrador, and then the island. We'll see this big warm push. And so talk about our normals, one, two, three degrees. We're talking about five, six, seven, eight degrees across the island for Thursday and Friday of next week. So that's pretty warm for this time of year. And of course, not great news for you snow lovers. Now in Labrador, again, pretty cold through this weekend and a warm push coming for that uh, as that system moves in Wednesday. But again, I do think it stays snow in the west with a possibility of some mixing for Happy Valley Goose Bay and the southeast. That's your forecast to now. Thanks, Ryan. Well, the St. John's Edge will soon tip off against the Niagara River Lions in their first franchise home game. Close to 5,000 people will fill up mile one tonight, with many eager to see the return of local basketball hero Carl English. We'll go back to the center now, where Jeremy Eaton is live. Jeremy, how long till the big game starts? Well, right now the clock says that there's 19 minutes of warm-up time left. Both Niagara's team and the St. John's Edge are on the floor warming up. It is a sellout crowd here tonight. That means there's in excess of 4,800 people will be coming down to the Mile One Center tonight. And the fans are already starting to pour in. Now, the merchandise has been an issue that's been on the go all week. It was supposed to arrive on Wednesday, but it never came in until this morning. But Maverick Sports will be selling it here at Mile One Center and at their shops downtown. But as you can see now, the gear is on sale and people are buying it. And if we just want to pan up here, over here, Bruce, I found uh, two fellas who are all decked out. This is Brody and this is Jesse. Brody, boys, how are you guys doing? How are you feeling tonight getting ready to watch a bit of basketball? Uh, really excited because, uh, as you can see, there's a bunch of basketball and we love basketball. And Jesse, uh, what do you think of the edge gear that you got on? What do you think of that clothing? Uh, very comfortable, warm. Uh, nice. Enjoy it. So who are you guys most excited to see out here for the St. John's Edge? Uh, Carl English. 
Have you ever seen him play basketball before? Uh, yeah, and videos. How is it going to feel, Jesse, to be able to watch him live? Exhilarating, exciting. Guys, well, I appreciate your time. You look great in the St. John's Edge gear. So as you just heard them say, they're all waiting to see Carl English play. Now, Carl hasn't played in Newfoundland and Labrador since the late 90s. So he's been a professional basketball player for the last 15 years, but it's been a long time since he's played on home court. And a lot of people here are very excited to see what he can pull up. Now, Carl just last week was named the Central Divisions Player of the Week. So he's only been in the league for two weeks, but he's already one of the best player. And people here at Mile One Center have high hopes for Carl English and the St. John's Edge. Reporting live from Mile One Center, I'm Jeremy Eaton for Here and Now. Well, some energy in there. <laughs> and I have to say, Debbie, I'm absolutely exhilarated working with you. I would every say night. when the, when when the game starts, well, when Carl is out on the floor, the blood will be pumping. The energy will ratchet up. Definitely, definitely. <laughs> Well, in uh, national and international news tonight, Canada's new Passenger Bill of Rights may soon be approved. It will spell out how an airline has to treat its passengers in cases of delay, bumping, lost luggage and more. But our country is behind much of the world in creating clear rules. CBC Marketplace's uh, David Common explains. What's yeah. your biggest beef when flying? Um, Delays, no. delayed a lot. Check out any airport. And lost luggage. Lost luggage. Lost luggage. And you'll hear them. You ever get uh, flight delays? Yes, about 40% of the time. 40% of the time. Delays do happen, but a big exclusion in the new passenger bill of rights means airlines won't have to pay if the delay is caused by a mechanical problem. Airlines should be liable for compensating passengers in the event of cancellation, delay, or overbooking that is somehow caused by mechanical issues. Chris Conrad faced that problem. Her flight was delayed, then canceled over a mechanical malfunction. It took 22 hours longer to get where she was going. They robbed me of an entire day of my vacation. I didn't sleep for 48 hours. I think they owe me at least uh, half of my airfare back. Air Canada did offer her a small discount on her next flight, but under both today's rules and the new ones, if the cause is a mechanical problem, no compensation is required. In Europe, it's a different story. Airlines must pay customers if the delay is substantial, even if caused by most mechanical problems. So why not in Canada? Well, we, we've decided that we don't want to put uh, that kind of imposition on the airline. Uh, we don't want, certainly don't want them to sort of, uh, in a marginal situation where something isn't working perfectly and decide to, to fly anyway. In Europe, they don't have to choose between safety and compensation. They get both. We're putting together our own Bill of Rights. That bill will clarify instances when compensation must be paid and sets out how much, say, for bumping or damaged bags. And the bill? is almost set to become law. David Common, CBC News, Mississauga. With their royal wedding just months away, Prince Harry and his bride-to-be, Meghan Markle, gave crowds a thrill today in the city of Nottingham. It was their first official appearance together since announcing their big engagement. The CBC's Thomas Degle was there. Well, Meghan Markle got a first taste of royal duties today, walking around Nottingham, England with her fiancé, Prince Harry. Uh, this is a city that's very near and dear to his heart. He's involved in several charities here. He's been here at least a half dozen times in recent years, and that's what he wanted to share with Meghan today, first taking part in a World AIDS Day event, taking up that cause that his mother, Diana, first espoused back when very few people knew much about HIV AIDS. They also met uh, school children and took part in an event at Nottingham Academy here uh, to mark uh, a charity that uh, Harry is involved with that uh, faces and combats youth violence here in a lower income area here in Nottingham. People lined the streets, gave the royal couple chocolates, flowers, candies, gifts, just to say hello and wish them well in their engagement. Here's what some of the royal watchers told us. I think in our modern Britain, a lot of people kind of, you know, poo-poo them or, or say they're not important anymore and they, they're not relevant. And I think just today just shows 
how relevant they are really. Um, they care about things, they care about the world, they care about people and I think in this world that's what we yeah. need. Harry and Meghan have now left Nottingham. Harry will have another public event on Monday in London with the Fire Brigade but it will be a solo event so it just goes to show you Meghan doesn't seem quite ready to join him on more events more regularly just yet uh, part of the royal family. Interestingly, the Sun newspaper here in London is reporting that uh, the couple have chosen May 26th as their wedding date. Kensington Palace only confirming that they will get married sometime in May. But I can tell you for the people here in Nottingham, meeting them, greeting them, wishing them well is the next best thing to attending a royal wedding. Thomas Dagg with CBC News, Nottingham, England. He was President Trump's national security advisor, but now Michael Flynn is pleading guilty and making a deal to testify against his old boss. Lock him up! Lock him up! The former Army general was jeered as he left the federal courthouse in Washington. Flynn admits he lied to the FBI back in January about contact with the Russian ambassador to the United States. He is now cooperating with the special counsel investigating Trump's ties to Russia. But Flynn denies he committed treason, a crime punishable by death. Our beautiful weather picture of the day comes to us from Labrador and uh, your clue today, it's coastal Labrador. Coastal. Can you guess the community? It's probably right over in the Straits where the ferry goes across. Good guess. That's a good guess, but uh, not correct. Okay. Have another crack after the Cartwright. break. Cartwright. <laughs> no. <laughs> Welcome back. Well, jumping off a plane strapped onto a wingsuit is hardly a, a walk in the park, but two men. <laughs> no kidding. Tried this, right? <laughs> they pulled off something much more breathtaking, jumping into a plane. Check this out. Not a stunt you should try if you are not an expert. Oh, these French wingsuit flyers dropped off a mountain in Switzerland. Look at their target. Yeah, trying to get there. And whoa, made it right inside the door. Don't hit the propeller. Oh. There you go. And oh. <laughs> Oh, That's oh. amazing. It took more than 100 practice runs apparently to get that right. No doubt. Why? Why I, would they do it? Because <sighs> they're the only two people on the planet that have done it. <laughs> I guess. I guess. <laughs> so there they go. That must be quite a nice sort of kind of flight. 
Okay, are we doing uh, some video here? Yeah. Okay. Uh, of course, uh, we had Mary Walsh on this week, right? And okay. um, sorry about big that. Big show. You got the Santa Claus Day Parade, but you've also got something else to look forward to this Sunday. Yeah, it's also the day hatching, matching, and dispatching hits television screens again. Mm -hmm. The cast of the characters from that Gemini Award-winning CBC series back together just in time for the holidays. Every time I turn around, Hunt's got a big bottle of whiskey or a bottle of rum stuck in somewhere poked underneath. Ah, there's one you won't get down your gullet, you dirty big booze bag. <laughs> <laughs> From what we've seen so far, this is going to be one funny movie. Yeah, fans certainly remember the show ran for one season. It's about a family that runs a wedding parlor, ambulance service, and a funeral home. Uh, so if you want to catch the antics of the Fury family, uh, park yourself in front of your TV. Sunday night, that's at 8.30 Island time for a Christmas Fury. Now, if you're like me, and you missed the first six episodes, and everybody's raving about them, the good news is that CBC Back has up, yeah. uploaded all six episodes, and you can find the link on my Twitter feed and also on my Facebook page. I just posted it there, so you can binge watch tonight, tomorrow, and then uh, watch the special on Sunday night. Okay, mm -hmm. Lee, let's turn our attention now to see who's celebrating birthdays and anniversaries this week. Happy 67th wedding anniversary to Annie and Reg King of Clarenville, who celebrated yesterday. Happy 94th birthday today to Myrtle Anderson in St. John's, formerly of Chance Cove, Trinity Bay. Happy 91st birthday to Bertha Melende of Paradise. Best wishes to Ron and Marie Denny of Cornerbrook, who are celebrating their 70th anniversary today. Happy 93rd birthday to Madeline Berrigan of Renews. Anniversary greetings to Peter and Sarah Murphy of Marystown, whose 55th wedding anniversary is today. Also celebrating today, happy 65th anniversary to William and Eileen Dwyer of Carboneer. And a big happy birthday is being sent to Frida Gillis of St. Fintan's, who celebrates her 107th birthday on December the 5th. Happy 59th wedding anniversary to Jerome and Josephine Travers of Southern Harbor, Placentia Bay. And happy 54th anniversary to Peter and Elsie Ingram of Marguerite. Best wishes to Scott and Mildred Daw of Seldom, Fogo Island, who will celebrate 65 years of marriage this Sunday. Happy 57th wedding anniversary to Marion and Junior Bailey of Grand Falls, Windsor. Happy 93rd birthday to Judy Cunard from Brig Bay. It's a golden anniversary today for Headley and Linda Wicks of Mount Pearl. Jim and Irene Edwards of Lawn are celebrating their 59th wedding anniversary this week. Best wishes to Herman Parsons, who is 90 years old. Happy 50th anniversary to Eric and Ruby Alcock of Grand Bank. And a belated 64th wedding anniversary greeting to William and Shirley Smith of Elliott's Cove, Random Island. They celebrated the big day on November the 18th. Happy 54th anniversary to John and Catherine Walsh. And best wishes to Teresa Cunning of Cornerbrook on her 90th birthday. A happy 93rd birthday to Viola Jones, originally from Point of Bay, now living in Lewisport. And congrats to Robert Toraville on his 91st birthday yesterday. Congratulations to Claude and Mildred Banfield of Buren on their 54th anniversary this week. Happy 59th anniversary to Alf and Luria Chislett of Anchor Point, whose special day was yesterday. Happy 59th wedding anniversary to Frank and Shirley Warfield from Charlottetown, Bonavista Bay. Happy 67th anniversary to Harold and Oliveira Swires of St. George's, who celebrated this week. Happy 57th anniversary to Don and Mabel Best of Fogo. Happy 90th birthday coming up on Monday to Bill Thibault. And a happy 97th birthday to Ina Newhook, formerly of Dildo, Trinity Bay. She is now in Conception Bay South. And congratulations to Bill Clark on his 90th birthday this coming Tuesday, formerly of New Perlican, Trinity Bay. He's now in Carboneer. And a happy 91st birthday this Sunday to Gerald Cranford of New Harbor, Trinity Bay. And best wishes to Marion and Howard Decker from Clarenville on their 60th wedding anniversary. A happy 91st birthday greeting to Clifton Loader of Summerside, who will celebrate tomorrow. Happy 50th wedding anniversary to Reg and Betty Hicks of Bonavista, whose special day was the 25th. Another golden couple, congratulations to Eric and Alvina Morris from Pasadena. Happy 54th anniversary to Joyce and Wilson Nicole of Rocky Harbor, who celebrated on the 22nd. 
Congratulations to Jack and Elizabeth Forward of Buckins on their 67th anniversary tomorrow. Happy 60th wedding anniversary to Bill and Alice Powers of New Perlican, now in Carboneer, who will be celebrating their 60th anniversary on the 5th. And happy 63rd anniversary this coming Monday to William and Babe Sharp of Upper Island Cove. And birthday greetings to Minnie Randall, who will be 90 years old December 9th. She's formerly of Winterbrook Bonavista Bay and is now in Mount Pearl. Fine looking crew again yeah. this week. Mm -hmm. Celebrating at a good time of the year for celebrations. Absolutely. Let's have a look at our viewer picture of the day. Uh, a couple of good guesses by uh, Debbie <laughs> before the break, but uh, not Cartwright and not the straights. In fact, this is the second time this week. Now, we usually try and spread the love, but this is the second time this week we're back to <laughs> McCovic. Oh. oh, I didn't think that'd be possible because you already had one this I week. Know. Oh, yeah, yeah. you yes. would have guessed sure, McCovic. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Right on the tip of my tongue. Uh, but uh, Michael Hare <laughs> is the second person to contribute. Just a beautiful picture from yes. the community this week, and I had to po I had to share it. Very All pretty. the mountains in the background, snow-capped, just beautiful. It is mm -hmm. certainly beautiful. Very pretty. So, of course, uh, the hustle and bustle uh, this weekend. Uh, thank you, Rod. Uh, there's my Facebook page, uh, which has uh, so many great photos and keep them coming. And I'm sure we'll see a lot of great photos from the Santa Claus Parade this weekend, mm -hmm. which is underway. And uh, our switcher director, Rod Dobbin, made a great point. We should remind everybody that they accept non-perishable food That's items right. there. Yeah. And you can also bring some money if you'd like and uh, bring your letters to Santa Claus. That's right. If you want to. And speaking of Santa Claus, we're all going to get a look at his new ride That's with right. that mm -hmm. spirit meter. I'm going to be cheering from the sides from my usual right. spot. And uh, maybe the spirit meter will And Ryan up. will be hanging that from the rearview mirror of the pumper truck that he gets to ride That's in. That's true. I'm Personally, the fire I department. think this whole broken foot thing was a hoax <laughs> to get a ride at this uh, Santa Claus Day production. Success! CBC investigates <laughs> on Monday. <laughs> yeah. Have, have a great a, weekend. Have a great weekend, everyone. See you back here on Monday. I'll bring the x-rays. <laughs> <laughs> Proof. <laughs>